Welcome everyone to this edition of Windows and Mirrors, a collaboration between the Division of Equity and Inclusion and EOP. This podcast intends to showcase the diversity of thoughts, experiences, and backgrounds of the Berkeley student body, faculty, and staff. With us today, we have a fifth year student from El Salvador studying mechanical engineering with a global poverty and practice minor here at Cal. This is his story. So I'm, I'm undocumented. Uh, I was born in El Salvador. Uh, when I was two years old, my family immigrated to the U.S. And um, I never knew those stories or I never knew what that meant. Uh, my parents never talked about it. And in high school was the first time where the title of undocumented and what it meant to be an immigrant affected me. Specifically when we were applying for FAFSA and university. Um, I didn't have, or I did have a social, which was strange. Uh, but when I asked my mom, what is it? Because I never knew I had one. Um, she told me, don't use it. Um, you're not supposed to give that number away. Uh, and, and then that opened up the conversation of like, oh, why not? Like, what, what do you mean? Um, and she told me like, we have a social, but you're not a resident of this country. Like you're under temporary protection. So whenever the government says that they want to end that protection, we, we have to go back to some other. So that just came as a complete shock to me. Like I didn't understand what that meant. And then going back to school, in high school, and having to explain that to my teachers, some of them didn't know what temporary protection status for Salvadorians meant, the PS. They didn't have that, uh, that idea. Um, some of them were barely trained in helping undocumented students. So being lost and not knowing what to do, first not knowing that I couldn't apply to FAFSA um, was kind of scary because I thought, okay, well, if I'm not supposed to be here, then I'm not going to be able to apply to college. So what's after college? What do I, what's after high school? What do I do? And um, that's when it started getting really scary. Um, so what I started to do was trying to find other folks in my situation. And um, it's surprising, I found a, a couple of, of like hidden figures um, around high school. There were folks who never mentioned their situation, just like mine. Um, and once I started talking to them, their experiences were also of like, I'm afraid that my parents are going to get deported. Um, I've never told anybody this. I never had to tell anybody like my my social or that I didn't have a social so conversations like this started popping popping up and there came a point where we started a support group for each other and we found out about the dream act we all applied together we all applied to colleges um, we all got accepted to colleges and so that was just beautiful like everything was falling into place so cool. So coming into getting accepted to Berkeley was amazing. Telling my mom, she didn't have a clue what that was. Uh, for her, it was just UCLA because it was close to home. But uh, I came to Berkeley during senior weekend. Um, and that's when I met like all these incredible people. Meng So was one of them. Um, freaking love him. He was uh, the counselor that I saw because of, of my undocumented status. And I remember seeing my financial aid package. And um, I was going to be charged hella money, and I thought that this was going to be free. Uh, senior weekend. And um, so I, I told Meg, like, listen, um, it, it, this doesn't seem to work. Like, I'm going to have to go back. I can't afford this. So somehow he figured it out. And he's like, don't trip. I got you. We'll, we'll figure it out. So he did. Stayed senior weekend. I love Berkeley. And I decided to SIR. Coming to Berkeley, same thing again. I got a financial aid package to begin with, that looked good. But once I got here, they, had, they adjusted it. And there was a point where I had to pay hella, like thousands of dollars. And I'm like, bro, I can't do this. Like, and I told them, like, I can't, this is not for me. I would rather just stay, you know, go to community college first and then try to transition to university because I can't afford this. Um, I told him my parents are working two jobs. Like, like I don't even see my mom sometimes because she's hella working. I don't want them to go through this. So, man, once again, he's like, don't worry. Like, 
we'll take care of it. What you have to focus on is academics and we'll figure out the financial aid stuff. And um, sure enough, that was that was Meng doing his thing. And I don't know how he did it, but there was weeks of stress where I wasn't eating because I didn't have money. And um, he found out a way to get funds from Sprawl Hall. And um, that's how I was able to get like uniforms. Um, there was a point where I couldn't afford housing at the units my freshman year. So he helped me get out second semester. It was a lot of like constant transitions, constant transitions. And he was always there for that. And I think most of the difficulty coming to Berkeley, not just, you know, being STEM, being low income, Historically, to represent the student color, um, I think every semester I have to prove that I'm I have protection. I have to prove that my social is still valid. So every semester, my financial aid package is just whack. Like there's nothing good about it. I look at it and I'm I'm like I don't understand these numbers. Why are you charging me hell of money? So there came a point where I just didn't look at my package anymore and let it happen. Let's let's see it's gonna get fixed. Something's gonna work. I don't know how it's going to solve itself, but it will. And um, every semester, I would get that message like, I need you to show me your, um, your proof of residency. If not, you can't get financial aid. And then beyond that, I have to wait for the government to give me this proof. So it's just a lot of back and forth, back and forth. And then if it's not proven, then I don't get funds. So I don't pay rent and I don't get money for food. So that's when the struggle comes in. And um, and that's just finances. That's and that has been happening every semester since freshman year, since summer bridge. Every semester since summer bridge, I, I've been having to do deal with these finances. Um, so that's why when like folks like Ruben tell me like don't worry about money, like to be honest, like yeah, like money like it'll come, it'll flow, but it's like um, the worry is always there. And beyond the financial aspect of it, like that title of being undocumented has closed a lot of doors. So there's been a lot of opportunities, a lot of internships, and a lot of scholarships that I've applied for and have been able to, except because of my status, I haven't been able to do it. So I'm always blocked like that. One specific one is uh, McNair's. So I had all the experience, I had all the documents, all the letters of recs ready, but um, just that, that title of like you need to be a U.S. citizen or a resident um, to have these resources were, again, very limited. So I had to go and talk to the guy in person. And um, he told me, like, no, like, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do. Uh, it has to be other uh, scholarships and go, go look for them. So I was like, ah, cool, like, I, I will look for them. And I saw throughout the years, I went sophomore year. And then throughout the years, I kept seeing a lot of my friends go through this program and like building their research and publishing and like showing folks what they've created. And I'm like, this is hella dope. Like, okay, the reason why they don't want me in the program is because they had to federally fund me. And I'm like, don't even worry. I'll go talk to them. I'll find my own money. I just want like the resources. Like, who teaches you how to do this? Who teaches you how to write like a research proposal? Like, I want to learn this. So I went to the guy again and uh, this was like last year so I, I waited two years again and uh, I went to go see him in person and I'm like listen I don't want your money like I'll fund myself um, is it okay like if I just participate in the program like, you know, go to these seminars go to these office hours and uh, again flat out was like a no no you can't do this and uh, <clears throat> at that point I was just like I'm, I'm so done I'm so done with people continuously telling me no continuously like having to try more than other folks. Um, and so I was about to like just break down <clears throat> and that was the point where he was like, no, but there's this other thing that you could do. It's a program called Fireball. If you revise this program called Fireball, which has been dormant for 11 years, um, you will be able to start the group of undocumented students who, who would want to do research and we'll find a way to fund you all. So like McNair's, but for undocumented students. So like, oh my gosh, man, it took you like four years to tell me this. Like if I would have known way back when, my sophomore year, I would have done it then. So I was like, all right, let's, let's do it. And just brought a bunch of um, folks together and we arrived at the program. And fortunately right now it's, it's 10 scholars, it's 10 of us doing research, 10 undocumented folks. 
and the funds are there, like we're getting paid to do what we love. So things things are getting better. But um, th- there's been a lot of a lot of doors closing. Um, and then going into like not feeling like I belong. Um, not only because of undocumented being undocumented. But being an undocumented Latino, Latinx, in STEM. So, coming into this field, I didn't see a lot of folks who look like me, you know, the typical story. And uh, it kind of sucked because all of my friends were in other majors. So all of my support system was in other locations like EOP, um, or they were like in my fraternity, or UO. None of these folks I could find um, were in engineering or get, I could get close to in engineering. So I would just go to my classes to get what I needed. Um, I didn't I didn't want to stay to office hours. I didn't want to stay to discussion sections because I didn't feel like um, I was happy then, if that makes sense. Um, one of the points was uh, just being feeling inadequate, feeling like no matter how much I tried, I was always not progressing. I was always getting C's, getting D's, and then just looking around me, I was like, you know what? This is probably not for me. Like, there's a, probably a reason why I keep doing bad in these classes. Like, maybe this is not where I'm supposed to be. And then I would look at other classes like ethnic studies. And then I saw like, I love folks of color. I, like, I love the energy. And I'm like, you know what? This 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 might be it. Um, and having to realize the the reasons why I wanted to sort of escape engineering. Um, were solidified when, when I was talking to Ruben, when I was talking to my mom. Um, so Ruben, uh, Elias Canelo Sanchez, like one of the uh, CE3 participants here, he told me that uh, there's a difference between not doing well in engineering because you don't understand what you're doing versus you understand what you're doing, but you're not doing well because there's you're shutting yourself down from the resources that would help you. And then once I saw that dichotomy of like, okay, now now I'm see what you're trying to get at. Instead of you know looking for support groups in engineering, I'm finding them in other spaces where they're there for me. So let me try to do that. So then I try to get closer to people that I was never accustomed to getting close to, um, people from different ethnicities. Um, so not not people that look like myself like. I wasn't, there wasn't a lot of black folks or Latinx folks, so I branched out a little bit. And um, sure enough, it was, it was definitely like a culture shock, cultural adjustment, and um, a socioeconomic adjustment. So talking to students who were like, oh yeah, like this weekend I'm gonna go to Switzerland because my parents are over there and there's no pay for me to go. Or like, oh yeah, like this weekend we're gonna go to like, I don't know, like some random ass place and this random ass bougie ass place. Um, telling me like, oh yeah, like my parents are, you know, they kind of, kind of like after graduation, they have the hookups for like me and um, this medical profession. Like my dad is a doctor now we're here. Like I'm so behind. Like I don't understand what I need to do. I don't, I don't know I should be here. Like it was a lot of those inadequacies. And I think just finding a way to persist, to continuously push on, um, with the help of like Ruben. My mom telling me to like, if you're almost there, just finish. Like it doesn't matter how you get there. Like if you get, end up crawling to the end, like just get there. So it was all these, all these folks like backing me up to the point where like, when I wanted to drop out of engineering, which was multiple times, it was always them who kept me like going, kept me going, kept me going. So like when I saw like those documents that told me like, you got D, you got C, like there's there's feelings of I'm not good enough. I would just put them to the side and not look at them and uh, just go to these classes and, and enjoy what I'm learning. Um, try to get the best I, I could out of these classes and not compare myself to other folks who seem like they would just go and, and get stuff. Like it just clicked for them. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know what y'all are doing. Damn, like all power to you. I just can't do that. And I think there was a point where I accepted my, my, my place um, and I learned my, not my limitations, but I learned what I could do in my time span, what I'm, what I'm physically capable of. So 
I think that's when I started prioritizing like health, um, wellness. I started prioritizing spending time with like my partner, um, escaping during the weekends, and then putting in hella work in the week days. So I started understanding this, and that's why reflecting back uh, on these five years of, of, of like uh, academia um, at Berkeley. I think like the first four years was was definitely like a constant struggle of should I be here? Is this for me? I don't think I'm good enough. I should go somewhere else. Constantly, constantly, every single time. Um, I don't have money. What am I gonna do now? You gotta go to financial aid again to tell them that I'm, the reason the money's not coming is because the government hasn't given me the proof. Um, so there was a lot of factors that I couldn't control. And um, it was four years of, of, of that, of like hot messes and uh, constant adjustment and constant growth. And yeah, I think like all of that has taught me and, and has made me like, that much more adaptable to situations, to, to whatever like life throws. And, and now like I, I feel comfortable with you know like people telling me now. And, and I just say, okay, like, I'll find a way. Like, there's, there has to be a way. Like, you're just, like, not seeing it. But I'll help you see it. Um, and, I'm, and I'm used to that now. There's, there's been a lot of times after that, for example, um, when I was trying to study abroad, and I found out about advanced parole, which is, like, permission to leave the country for academic reasons. So when I found out about that, I, would, I went to my study abroad counselors and let them know like, oh, I want to go. And then I would talk to folks at EOP and let them know that I want to go. And um, for them, it was just like a feeling of wanting to be, wanting me to be most safe. So they were like, no, I don't think you should do that. I don't think the right time is yet. Um, France was telling me, oh, no, you can't. Or like the, the study abroad counselors for France were like, oh, no, you can't go. Um, you don't have the GPA for this program. I'm like damn, like, but I'm in different, like you know, this is this is very different, um, and I'm not gonna take engineering courses over there, so I had to convince hella folks. I'm just gonna continue on applying, continue on pushing, continue on pushing, and sure enough, like after the first couple of no's, like study abroad office, like showed me a different program that was not where I wanted to go specifically, but they let me know like, oh, this is available for you. You want to go? You don't. It's a two point seven. You have a two point seven three. <laughs> You're good to go. Um, I didn't need to learn French. I didn't need to know French. And then the other program, I needed to know it. I'm like, yo, I, I don't have time to study French right now. Like, I'll learn it over there. That's where I'm going. Um, and so it seemed like things were, all, were falling into place. And, and I just got, I learned how, how to work it, I think, since how to work the nose. And yeah, and, and I think at this point, Reflecting back, it's, it's come to the point where I, I'm just, I'm glad to be done, but there's so much that I, I need to now give back to my family because I've, I've seen that I've not only struggled with myself, but like being so far away from fam, um, I've noticed that like my mom having to work like from five in the morning until like 4 p.m., being hella exhausted, coming home, and like still finding a way to help me fund my education. So she was trying to send me money for rent. And um, I would always feel guilty having this money because uh, I'm like, no, like, y'all need it. Like, you, you need it for, you know, for food for Stephanie. You need the food for yourself, for my dad. You need to cook bills. Um, so that's why whenever I had money for, like, EOP, like, as a pack, all that money, I always felt so, so bad about spending it on myself. So, like, whenever we would go out with friends, like, I would always just buy, like, you know, like, dessert or, like, something small. Um, and then I would just eat at home and like, eat hella and then go out. Or, like, when we go out, I would just wait for people, like, to buy food. And then whatever they left over, which was hella food because they, like, they didn't eat it all, I'm like, oh, you still want that? Like, oh, I, I got you, I got you. So I'll, I'll finish hella food that way. Um, and when it comes to clothes, like, I would always go to, like, the... H&M, like, clearance sales and just buy, like, $5 shirts or, like, $10 shirts. 
Uh, so it was always that concept of like, I can't be spending too much. I can't. This is not. This money here equals this many hours of my parents' work. That's how I thought about it. And I, and I think it, it's not going to be until like I start making money that I'm able to support them, then I'll feel more comfortable with spending this, these funds. Um, which I'm excited about. I'm, I'm excited that I'm, I'm going to like work soon and putting money for savings and putting money for them. So, yeah, man, I, I think this is, it's been a tough road. Like, I'm just I'm so glad it's just done. It's, it's been a lot of lessons, a lot of, a lot of failures, more failures than anything. And um, I think that's what's made me a lot more uh, adjustable. Thank you for listening in today, and we hope you'll join us next time on Windows and Mirrors. Farewell, and go Bears!